All right, so just a reminder where we are for our schedule that a week from today will be your midterm. So kind of covering everything through today's lecture, homework 124. Um, so we started out week one with looking at measurements and errors and quantifying that. And we looked at distance measurements. Uh, First part of the week was taping and corrections with taping, and then electronic distance measurements. We'll see today with the total station how uh, we utilize those in, in practice as far as the EDM. Then leveling, uh, different types of leveling, differential leveling is the initial one, profile leveling, three wire leveling, being comfortable with general calculations, field notebooks, corrections, uh, disclosure, things of that nature with leveling. And then last week got into angles and two types of angles. So we've got vertical angles. Vertical angles really are used with total stations because we initially we measure a slope distance, convert that slope distance to a horizontal distance using that vertical angle. And then horizontal angles to measure angles between points and directions from point uh, one point to another. And to describe and quantify those directions, there are kind of two general techniques as far as nomenclature, defining that direction either as an azimuth or a bearing. So be comfortable with both of those, uh, calculating angles from those, etc. We looked at uh, one of the field techniques that's commonly been used is magnetic declination. Um, so having a bearing or azimuth relative to that magnetic compass needle and trying to do retracements. So all that kind of material is kind of what you can, uh, what you can expect from that. So on class on Wednesday, I'll kind of have that be a bit of a, uh, bit of a review. We'll, we'll look at some different examples. I'll post a sample midterm between now and then. Um, so you can prepare for next week's midterm. So uh, before I dig into the total stations, uh, one thing that I thought would be kind of maybe just fun to get exposure to, we've been talking about angles, talking about uh, azimuths and bearings and magnetic declination and stuff. And certainly that pops up in surveying. But another cool application is not aeronautical maps. So click on this to sort of load an aeronautical map. Do we have any pilots or aspiring pilots in the room? Okay. So uh, you know, this is like a, a national viewer. Uh, so you can kind of zoom out, look at whatever sort of part of the country you're in. Uh, the little circles you see, those generally speaking are airports of some nature, and they've got you know, regions around that that are sort of controlled airspace. And so the eastern part of the country that's certainly more dense, a lot more airports. Uh, you see constant sort of circles everywhere. Western part of the country that's a little bit more sparse and open, a little bit less so. So if we zoom in here to Portland, we've got Portland Airport, uh, arrows around here, and for example, a lot of busyness on this map, so I'm not expecting this to be, this, this will not be on the exam, this is just going to trigger and sort of a cool connection to what we're studying, but so like this right here, this little blue circle that you see, what we can from that, this actually is a azimuth compass reading. And so we've got our zero line actually kind of right here. So this would be the showing the declination of the compass needle. This is kind of where your north arrow is, so it's not your compass speed between your plane that you're looking at. This is where you'd be seeing a zero reading as far as that north arrow. And then running around here, your uh, 0 to 360 angle, but aeronautical maps may uh, truncate to 0 in a lot of things because you've got big numbers like 1,000 feet and stuff where you can like truncate a lot of windows. Uh, so you know, this is 
240 degrees, 180 would be down here, and 300 degrees, etc. So, you know, if you zoom out and kind of look at a different regions of the map, you know, up here you've got another volcano or something like that. This one is like over here. You can clearly see the fuel marker there. That's the one that's on the north. And then here. And then, for example, you've got different flight paths that are depicted on here. These flight paths are kind of these blue lines that you see. And so they're kind of like a Older section of flight paths that would be these leaf flight paths, which are out of 20 or 28. And those would have radio uh, sort of guiding guidance for the pilots to follow. And once you take off from you know, an airport, uh, you can you know, go on a certain bearing to get into that flight path, and then this flight path would be. 54 degrees is the compass sheet. So you know, once you get into this flight path, 54 degrees going on this, and that flight path would have instructions for you as far as uh, obstacles, you know, like minimum height you need to be above based on you know, mountains or buildings or whatever sort of instructions you might have, and you know, the number sort of limits to you know, the corridor that you can fly between. And that would be a flight path specifically to you know some some destination. So you know like that one is coming over here. Uh, you know, looks like ultimately it's going to be going towards Yakima. Uh, that's kind of where it's at. So they've got these sort of controls for a flight path for that, and they're all sort of based on some sort of uh, azimuth reading from your magnetic compass. So you might sort of take off at any point in time. So. Another application where that kind of familiarity with uh, bearings and uh, azimuths and declination uh, comes in comes in handy because that's how you kind of get around there. Any questions? Okay. So today uh, we're gonna. Break out the total stations, look at how those operate, become a little familiar with that. We're going to be utilizing total stations in lab, and they are a little bit more complicated because with the total stations, we have to become level, like we did with the levels, as well as centered. And doing those two in combination with each other does have a good impact. So we want to see how to operate that so that. Lab goes somewhat smoothly. We'll then look at a few different methods that we utilize in the field for measuring and recording those horizontal angles. Our total stations, we are going to be utilizing those to calculate all quantities that we've looked at so far. So we'll be calculating distances, calculating vertical angles, horizontal angles, the whole sort of shebang with this. Um, and so Ultimately, in order to do that, we can do the EDM and measure the angles from our instrument, but we need to um, calculate what location in space is the instrument occupying. So we need to know the coordinates X, Y, and Z of the total station. And then once we do that, then we can calculate X, Y, Z at any point that we measure to. So we'll look at techniques that we utilize in the sort of math uh, tricks that computations that happen on for the instrument to, to determine those locations. And then lastly, we'll talk some about the, the errors we have with our angles. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and set up some here, and then we'll, we'll talk about some of these various methods of measuring angles. Thank you. 
parts we have. We've got the tripod, exactly the same as with the level. We've got our total station instrument here. It mounts to the tripod more or less the same. But you've got the hole with threads there. They're threaded through on the tripod. Line those up. Thread those in. And we'll make sure it's somewhat in the middle of that tripod platform. These are electronic, you know, so they've got batteries. Got phase one, phase two display. And so the two potential options you have, you've got this face, the big computer screen, big thing, or this face. And so this would be considered your direct face, phase one, because this is usually where you're wanting to stand and operate and control the instrument. The sight view here. This uh, rotates 360, this rotates 360. So when you're doing a phase two reading, you would plunge this, rotate this, so you're sighting through here, the screen you're looking at kind of looks like that. So those are those two. You've got um, the power button there, so I can turn that on, piece up. Little older Windows based kind of operating system boots up for us. Okay, so then it takes you sort of to your, to your main screen here and all. Just get to this point here to, to go ahead and talk about these various methods. So we're wanting to measure horizontal angles. And we have three kind of techniques that commonly are used to do that. First one seems just relatively straightforward and simple. It's just sort of repetition. So I've got an angle. I've got a station that I'm going to occupy. Around. And so over here is your reflector, so your bipod, there's a bubble level here so I can adjust the drag length so that it's held. So I get it leveled, I just point this and it's looking at the instrument so I can sort of you actually kind of look at this reflector, you should see three wires that are crossing in the middle where they intersect. That's the point you're wanting to sight across the red line. And it's called a reflector because you can probably see if you look at it that it's just a parallel meter behind it. And so this is the PDM, it's a laser that's being sent, reflects off this, bounces back. But so I have uh, either two of these, one on this station, one on the other station, or if I just have one, I can cite this one, zero my angle, carry that over to the next station, and measure the, the horizontal angle. And so I'm measuring based on getting my initial back shot that I zero at the angle, hit zero, rotate, measure. Kind of the most simple kind of repetition there. And if I want to do it multiple times, I can just have direct face hit zero, rotate, sight, measure, record the angle. I want to do it a second time with direct face, zero, measure. I want to do that with the reverse face, I plunge it, go back, sight the back shot. Zero the angle and rotate station, sight, measure, repeat. So 
that's kind of the, the repetition method, relatively straightforward. You're just measuring a single angle. And the more times you measure it, the uh, higher accuracy and lower error interval you can get. So if you've got a really high level of class of survey you're trying to meet, maybe you need to do it eight times. If you've got a lower class of survey that you're trying to meet, maybe just a, a single direct and reverse is sufficient. You know, often with these total stations, because they are quite accurate and you get an experienced crew out there, uh, you know, you could uh, get, get away with just, just two measurements and the, the error interval would often be small enough that it would be sufficient for a lot of work that you do. The second uh, repetition for the method listed over, over there on the right, uh, that was kind of a common method when we had the kind of three tools in our toolbox. We had our tapes for the horizontal distances. We had the levels for the elevation. And then we needed to measure angles between stations. So we had a theodolite. The theodolite looked kind of like this, but it only would measure angles. It didn't do any of the distance measurement. And so what I brought in last week was a digital theodolite. And on that one, um, I could zero my angle initially, rotate over site, and then press hold. And so hypothetically, let's, let's say this was about a 30 degree angle. I press hold, go back and site my station again, hit release, it would be starting at 30 degrees, rotate at another 30, be up to 60. It more or less is just kind of adding up your number of angles for you, but then you would just divide by the number of angles at the end to get your mean. Um, so, yeah, I guess that was a, a common tool back in the day, but with modern technology and storing things on the computer uh, memory and stuff, it's a little different. So, repetition method there. Next method, rec method. And this would be where you are setting up your total station, and you've got a bunch of different stations that you need to cite. So you've got a bunch of stations that you need to cite. Those measurements all need to be based on a given reference point. So I would set my reflector up on my zero point, my control point. So I cite there, hit my zero to kind of zero out. Okay, all my measurements are based on this north bearing, and then I would, you know, measure station one, measure station two, and I wouldn't re-zero zero at each time. I would just measure zero, 20 degrees, 40 degrees, 90 degrees, etc. as far as the stations, and then I would calculate the actual angle between these two stations is the difference between 79. So you could do that and then just do a one back here and then you rotate. And it's just a little bit more efficient work to kind of do that where you do one zero and then you know, multiple readings. Um, so it's common, common technique there. When you plunge the instrument, they're kind of two methods a surveyor could utilize for their work. You could, when you plunge the instrument, you could go back to your back site and uh, re-zero it. That's an option. The other option is when you plunge and sight, in theory, if you were sighting the back shot, it should just say 180. Because you know, I went from sighting it here to plunging and rotating, if everything was perfectly aligned and there was you know, no misalignment, that should be reading exactly the same. And so you could go ahead and just cite all the stations, recognizing that the phase two should just be plus 180 to those correct base readings and you should be good to back out.
So, you know, there's just example field notes, you know, where you sort of record those, you know, with your spacing, your siding, measurement, measurement. And so this angle here between um, spacing R and S, the difference between the two. So we're not saying that this angle is 37 degrees and this angle is 77 degrees. This one's 37 because it's 37 minus 0. This one is 74. So the last technique for measuring horizontal angles is exactly the same as the direct lens we just talked about, but it closes the horizon to sight back on your back shot. And so you re-sight that, which means have everything in perfect alignment, that's keeping the zero even. But if it's not, quantification of some error in our measurements, then we can check the precision and see if it meets the requirement and adjust the course. So this would be a higher, higher level precision work, uh, closing the horizon. So if you've got one of those uh, more precise survey requirements, you can go through the extra effort to do this. Otherwise, for those lower level Okay, so just kind of an example from that. We've got a closing horizon example. Our total spacing is set up on the piece A, and we're citing the location of our measurement and reflector. We have a back shot B, that's going to be zero as the angle. So we have a back shot here, zero. So we measure spacing C, measure spacing B. Or we drive it back to B, and we're going to locate the graph of the line. So we just want to quantify um, what the B angles X, Y, Z are for this these measurements. So I'm just going to make a table. Station. And so these are the stations that I'm citing from my total station. So I initially cite B with my back shot, then C, then D, and back to B. And I have a direct face reading and a reverse. This is initially just transferring the information above into these columns. So zero, 26 degrees, 29 minutes, 21 seconds, 92 degrees, 57 minutes, 44 seconds, zero degrees, zero minutes, four seconds. And then same thing with reverse, 0, 26 degrees, 29 minutes, 17 seconds, 92 degrees, 57 minutes, 46 seconds, 0 degrees, 0 minutes. So from our direct or reverse, we can just kind of look at these and average out. So we get the average reading as far as that sighting between the direct and reverse. So our initial zero at B is zero, our average. Our average at station C is just the minutes that vary in each one of these. So we're 
We're averaging 21 and 17, so it's 19 seconds. 26 degrees, 29 minutes, 19 seconds. At station D, we're just averaging the seconds, 46 and 44. So the average is 45. 92 degrees, 57 minutes, 45 seconds. And then when we close that horizon, slide it back at our initial start station. And a little bit of error, four and two, so the average of that is three seconds. Our measured angle is where we look at the differences between those angles. So first one's easy because it's the second reading minus zero. So 26 degrees, 29 minutes, 19 seconds. And that is our angle PAC. Second one, 92, 57, 45, minus 26, 29, 19. That gives us 66 degrees, 28 minutes, 26 seconds. And that's our angle C, A, D. And lastly, our zero here. Angle difference, and so that works out to 267 degrees, 2 minutes, 18 seconds. Yeah, so the easiest way to to write this would be 360 degrees, 59 minutes, 60, actually, do it this way, 359, 59, 63 seconds, because 60 seconds here would be full one carry one that'd be 360 degrees or three seconds above that so just add three to that 60 63 then you can just do the math straight away with 92 57 45 to get that 267 2 and 18. So we've got our three angles that we average and direct from first base. We've got those three angles. If we had no error, they would add to 360. When we add them up, we get 360, 0, and 3 seconds. So we have an error of 3 seconds. We'd have to compare this versus our precision standard. And as long as we met our precision standard with our three seconds of error, then we would go ahead and correct our error. Because we know there's error, let's go ahead and get rid of this error. We have to make it look good. And so there are you can either do a weighted correction or a uh, unweighted correction. Commonly, they would do um, the 
easiest way is just take the number of angles or degrees that are leveling, divide by that, and take it as a function of accordingly. So if we did that, then you need three seconds of air, three angles, three divided by three fourths, so it's just sitting at one second of the speed. So that's kind of the, the easiest, make that 18, make that 25, make that 17. The majority of our error in our sliding slopes, our angles, comes at the siding location. And so if you've got a narrow angle that you're measuring, you've got error at this siding, error at this siding, and each one of those sidings is a bigger component of your angle that was measured versus a really big angle. You know, then you've got just a little small window here, a little small window there. And so generally speaking, the narrower your angle, the more likely you've got error in there. And this is just one big angle. So uh, a weighted one would actually tell us it's maybe um, you know, two minutes here, one minute here. Uh, the probability of where you're Any questions on that initial discussion? Okay, so let's go ahead and look at how we set up our total station. So in our total station, you know, we've got these three main parts. You've got your tripod, you've got your uh, total station on top, and then you've got your reflector on staff. And so once you boot it up, or turn it on to the initial startup screen, I'm going to go into general survey, which is the first big menu on the left. It says general survey. The options are survey, settings, uh, setup, files, internet, support. And it's kind of obvious that we're going to go survey. So we're Survey. If I go into it, it starts to load. And then it takes me to another screen. This screen gives me a few different options. I've got an option that I can set up a job. So if I'm going to be siding stations and storing those values on the onboard computer. I'd want to set up a job to store those two that I could then export and import into Excel or whatever. Um, so that would be the common technique that your surveyor in the field would be doing. If you set up a job, you can record those measurements and store them on board. Uh, then a couple other options. Now there's uh, for actually doing a measurement, uh, there's a measure option, there's a stakeout option, and there's an instrument option. Uh, so each of those has different functionalities within them. For just a simple uh, survey, I can just hit uh, an instrument and there's an option for survey basic. And when I do that, there's a laser that gets turned on because now it's saying, okay, we're going to set this instrument up for doing our survey measurements and this needs to be centered and level before I start. So, for example, let's say this is my station, big X, that I want to be set up over. I need to be directly vertically over it with that laser 
and the bubble level needs to be centered. So you know, initially you want to be you know, somewhat close. You kind of choose where you're going to plant your legs. And then the technique that I recommend is called walking the tripod. And what you do is you look at where you initially are and where you need to move that laser. And we're going to choose one of the three legs to be our pivot point. So it stays anchored in the ground. And the other two legs we're going to pick up. So I'm going to choose that far leg is my pivot point. I'm going to pick these two legs up and then just walk it and just move until that laser gets pointed close to my X. And then I just kind of slowly kind of let those feet down, you know, until I'm close. I don't, I don't have to worry. I got adjustments to do still. So I don't need to worry that, like, oh, I'm not exactly right. But I want to be close. You know, if I'm setting it down, I'm over here. Well, that's probably not good. You want to be within uh, probably at least a, a pencil distance, probably closer than that. Um, so you just kind of want to set it down. And again, the easiest way is you just keep one leg pivot, just kind of move it around until that laser gets over the point, and then you just kind of slowly put it down. So you can. Visually look up here, I'm not anywhere close to level. So I'm not even getting close to where I need to be. But this is the initial part is just walking the tripod to get over the point. Based on what we did with leveling, we often use these tripod things to adjust it, right? I want to illustrate why that is not will eventually. But if you start, after you get initially centered, if you start messing with the tribrox legs, I just do like a couple little twists. I'm probably already with those three little twists, you know, two pencil widths away from where I need to be centered. And I'm probably never going to get there. Because it's, it's really the and so the reason why we move so much, uh, I think the adjustment in our fiber rock screws on our total station is maybe a little bit even more limited than our, our level. Um, down there a little bit. But um, so you saw that just a little bit of adjustment there really throws that level off. The other option we have to get centered is to adjust tripod leg length. And as an illustration, this leg length, look, look how much the bubble that laser is moving. It hardly moves at all. Like I can significantly change the level based on the leg length, where the laser moves me. Anyone think of why this functionality is happening? No, it's not. That. So the laser, yeah, it's just based on the um, center of this instrument, just shooting a straight one down. So with the tribrox screws, this instrument pivots right about the center of this platform. And so when you start adjusting the tribrox screws, your pivot points way up here. So you're four feet above the ground. And so you angle it a little bit here, that translates to a big distance. When you start adjusting the legs, your platform level is down here at the ground. 
And so you're adjusting you know, the, the length of the legs there, but because it's down here, it doesn't have the extreme four feet of projection. So it really throws the level off. So you can do significant adjustments with the legs and not significantly affect your center point. So with that understanding, the uh, technique you want to utilize so that you can get centered and leveled in a reasonable amount of time is walk the tripods first to get your initial laser center. And then to get your initial leveling here, you want to use just the leg lengths and not the extra strokes. If you're uh, going to adjust the legs, can, uh, initially, when you're grossly out like this, it is kind of obvious. Like, okay, this is my low point, here's my high point. Um, you've got a bunch of different bubble levels that you can look at. There's a bubble level right here on the total station itself. There's a bubble level here on the tribrock itself. There's also a digital bubble level on this screen and a digital bubble level on you got lots of places to look. The digital bubble levels are slower to react. So initially, you'll get more immediate feedback by looking at the air bubble, so either on the tripod or rotating around. If this were flat, the bubble would be in the middle. When it's not flat, the bubble goes to the high side. Just kind of look at your bubble, however it's oriented. Right now my bubble's over here saying, this is the high side of my platform. So I either need to lower down this side by lowering these two legs, or raise this side up by lengthening this one. One of the challenges we have working where we do out in the hardscape of Lovejoy Fountain is ideally we would be in uh, dirt and we could drive these feet in you know several inches to the ground so they're really anchored because we can't do that in a hardscape it's really easy to let's say i want to lift this leg or bring this leg up i accidentally lift this leg oh no you know now i'm i'm off centered again i gotta start all over um so be aware of that. And what you want to do in particular if you're extending a leg is before you release it, put pressure on this leg to drive it down into the hardscape. Then you release the lever and then you kind of raise it this way. So you keep that pressure for driving down so it doesn't lift up on you. So that's how you would raise a leg. Lowering a leg you know, is a little bit easier. I still generally do the same technique where I sort of grab and pinch to kind of secure that before I release. But then to lower a leg, I do the same thing. Grab that leg. Uh, so those are the two different techniques. Uh, I have. So right now my bubble is kind of moving around and right now the bubble is kind of directly opposite this leg. And sometimes when a bubble gets directly opposite the leg that is a makes a easier identifier as far as which leg would be most advantageous to adjust. And you know, if you look at the digital level that's on there or any of these others, I'm starting to get close. Uh, the bubble, instead of being grossly out of center, is kind of like touching the edge of the bullseye now. It's not quite in the middle of the bullseye, but it's getting closer. You know, it's a good point now to double check your center. I'm still pretty close to center, so that's okay. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and do. 
another leg just a little bit closer. Pretty close now. And to get it exactly in the center with the legs does get a little hard, but I think I'm close enough now that I can do the final adjustment with the pry bar. And so the final adjustment with the pry rock screws, this will be exactly the same as with the level. You center your scope between two pry rock screws and adjust them either both in or opposite rotation both out, the bubble will follow my left thumb, right here. I just need it to move a hair that way. I'm just going to do a real small adjustment that way. And remember that the digital screen is slow to react. So adjust it a little bit, let it move. Adjust it a little bit, let it move. I think that's probably good that way. The bubble's here and I need to move it this way. So I'm going to let go grab this one. I'm in the green. This has an automatic compensation. Uh, with, once you get within three minutes, I think it is, of between levels, you can get in this sort of green window. I recommend getting it as close as possible to the center. Now is where I recheck my center. And my center is close to my X, but it's not exact, right? Slightly off. Um, if you started out and when you mounted your tripod on the middle of your, or mounted your pillow station on the middle of your tripod, if you follow this procedure and you're this close, you can get there by just loosening the nut a little bit and then sliding it. And I probably have about an inch I could slide it on the surface of this tripod center. And so I scooted it over there. I retighten it so it looks centered. Double check my level. My level. Now I've accomplished both. Now is where I can get my set. Um, once you hit accept then the laser goes away. Questions about that? Yeah. Just curious about the uh, Yeah, so if you're experienced, let's see up here. So, let me do it here and how long it takes without all the Okay, so I got my laser plummet there.
bubble. Yes, it was. I did um, minute and a half, something like that. So, you know, if you're experienced, that's as painful of a process as it is, so it's not super laborious. But I guarantee tomorrow or Friday when you go out there, the first time you're going to, you know, it's probably going to take you at least 10 minutes because you're going to start to do one thing and it's going to bite and you're going to do the other. So it takes a while. So I, I recommend everybody this week, you know, rotate rolls. Give them an opportunity to work on the instrument um, because it's a, it's a good skill to develop. And you know, once you if you follow that procedure, walk the tripod, do your initial leveling with the legs, then fine tune with your pry bra. And if you need to recenter, uh, loosen, and slide, it's not too too difficult. Okay, so I've got all that sort of description sort of in the steps there. So, you know, the seven steps I sort of walk through um, to ultimately get set up with your instrument. Once you get up, set up with your instrument, um, the next menu that pops up once we sort of finish that leveling and center is it asks for the pressure and the temperature. So the EDM, if you remember when we talked about that back in week two, there can be slight error that's present if um, as the temperature gets you know warmer or colder, you know, it just travels different in that medium. And so as long as you enter Pressure, it does those onboard corrections here so that the data you're measuring doesn't need any heat loss. And so that's just where you want to obviously it prompts you here initially as your setup what's the temperature, what's the pressure, set the tone, enter it. But then if you're working out in the field all day and it starts out, it's 40 degrees in the morning when you first set up your instrument, you know, at noon it's gone up, you know. 20 degrees, you want to make sure that you're sort of updating that a couple times throughout the day so that it's doing those corrections. All right, so now here's the fun part. So um, we enter that temperature, enter that pressure, accept. So now I just went into that simple survey option. And what do we have here? We've got what's currently displayed, it says HAVASD. Horizontal angle, vertical angle, slope distance. So, and you can toggle this uh, arrow on the left, different, or you know, have different views. So now it says horizontal angle HPVD, so horizontal distance, vertical distance. Um, or if you input coordinates for the station, they'll do marginal position and elevation. So, so those are kind of the different ones. This initial one, the HAVASD, uh, so the vertical angle, you know, that's your zenith angle, that's absolute, where directly overhead, that's your zero angle. And then it goes from zero to 180 on the stage one reading, and then 180 to 360 on the sort of stage two kind of fighting. So that's the vertical angle, and that vertical angle is necessary because when you cite the reflector, it's actually a slope distance. But let's, uh, there is somewhere here. So uh, for this one, you've got 
your You've got your distance focus here, your crosshair is focused here. This does fine tune um, vertical angle adjustments. This does fine tune horizontal angle adjustments. Especially like when you push it with your finger, you know, you can command these growth adjustments. But then you're like, oh, I'm getting close to the crosshairs. How do I get it like exactly on the crosshairs? That's where you'll want to use these knobs to do this sort of fine tune. Oh, it seems a little less, a little less. Um, and then on the top here, this is where you've got your, your gun sight. When you stand, stand back from your gun sight, you should see like a little uh, white triangle. And so before you try and sight the reflector, you want to use that gun sight, stand back, see your white triangle, and hit the white triangle close to the target before you then start looking in the mirror. Otherwise, you're just going to see you know, a building, a tree, a trunk tree. I don't see my reflector. So you got to get close to the gun sight before they look there. Uh, so do you want to look through? Uh, did I set it up too high? <laughs> it might just be too short for this. Uh, your face is almost. Big outer one, that does your distance focus. Yeah, so that's where you'll want to focus, and you should eventually get to where you see the reflector and see the three wires. Yeah, yeah, and, I see the three wires. And this is what the actual viewfinder you're looking at looks like this. And so, this little cross right here, this is what you want that centered. Directly in those three wires. Is the focus being turned this way? So you've got the uh, crosshair focus, which is that small one you just did, and then the you know outer ring was the distance focus. As long as you can see both the crosshairs and the wiring. And you just get it so that that intersection is right in line with the intersection of the wires. And if it is, you just go and hit measure. Is that close? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so then you just hit your measure, sending the laser back and forth, and now it tells us. Slope distance was 22.70. Um, so you look at the horizontal distance. Horizontal distance between here and there is 22.709 centimeters. And then if we are wanting, if this is our initial fighting in the field, there's an option here that I can have this be my zero back shot. So right now my horizontal angle. It's just some arbitrary number because whatever the orientation of the instrument was relative to, to the pry rock last time it was zeroed. That's what I'm reading. So right now the horizontal angle says 293.1733. Some random number. But if this is my back shot that I then want to zero, I can hit zero on the angle. So now my horizontal angle reads 000. zero, zero. So now I So, okay. Whew. All right. So that was the fun as far as using the instrument. So you'll get experience in lab this week. 
Uh, now, I was wanting to look at some of the computations we do with our total station. So this first one, we kind of looked at this figure in class last week, where initially we always need two control points. Those control points, based on the coordinate system, usually they're state plane coordinates that we're working on, those allow us to calculate our delta x and our delta y between those control points. And if we calculate the arc tangent, We then have gone out in the field, we did all our measurements, and we've got, you know, measurements of these distances, you know, we have some table, and we have all this statistical data, but ultimately we're wanting to calculate x, y, z coordinates of each of these stations, and so this kind of reinforces this basic geometry and what we talked about last week. We set our instrument up here at station A, we did a backsiding to station W, and then we turned the angle to station E, and that angle was 165 degrees, 20 minutes. So we want to know, well, what is this azimuth of AE, and then once we know that azimuth of we already know the coordinates of point A, 5,000 north and 5,000 east east. We're then going to calculate the coordinates of point B. So, what do I need to do with this angle? Uh, <clears throat> so, you're saying, yeah, you, you could use the, the trig of your delta y, delta x to find this angle. Um, this would be 90 degrees. Add those together, subtract them for 180. That would get you there as far as your angle. So, that's one way. The method we talked about in class last week that is the common technique when you go polygon instead of polygon on itself, is if you have an azimuth here, you can calculate the back azimuth from A to W, which is add or subtract 180, then add the field angle, and then your net coordinate. So, I think that's what, that's what I'm going to do. So, I'm going to Calculate my delta x, delta y, figure out this initial azimuth from W to A, and then I'll calculate the back azimuth from A to W, and I add my field angle with my azimuth A to E, and then break in delta x, delta y, delta y, delta Z, figure out my coordinates.
So in our state plane coordinate system, the delta y is given as the north of you. north are you? Whatever reason, um, I guess be, maybe because you know north is like the cardinal direction, and so then northing people thought, oh, we should take northing first. But we typically say northing eastward, and what that translates to is we say y x. So northing eastward, northing is the y coordinate, eastward is the x coordinate. So not our convention as far as Cartesian coordinates are concerned, x, y, z, but uh, you know, the, the, the northing is how far north you are, but it is the y coordinate, eastward is how far east you are. <clears throat> so our delta y in that little triangle, we're going from 5,000 northing at A, or 4,900 northing at W. So we've got a delta y of 100 feet. Our delta x, we're at 10,000 east feet at A, 9846 at W. So that is a 154 feet. So then the Azimuth from this is W to A is going to be equal to the arctangent of that delta Y over or delta X over delta Y. So 154 feet over 100 feet. So that works out to be. 57 degrees, 0 minutes, 8 seconds. So the azimuth from A to W that's just my azimuth from W to A plus 180 degrees. 5708 plus 180. That gives us 237 degrees, 0 minutes, 8 seconds. That is on our diagram. This is your north reference point. That's saying that that angle right there, that's our 30 seconds. Don't do the north clockwise. Field angle. That field angle is. 16520 azimuth of aw plus angle this is wae that's our 23708 plus 165 degrees, 20 minutes. So that comes to 402 degrees, 20 minutes, 8 seconds. So that's one full revolution plus a little bit. We can just subtract the full revolution of 360. That our azimuth AE is 42 degrees, 20 minutes, 8 seconds. And 
Now the horizontal distance measurement from A to E, that's our 285.13. We want to break down our delta X and delta Y components from that. We've got uh, azimuth right here, 42 degrees and change. So the delta X component is the horizontal distance, the hypotenuse, times the sine of the azimuth. And the delta Y is that horizontal distance times the cosine of the azimuth. So delta X is HD from A to E times the sine of our azimuth AE. That's 285.13 times the sine of our 42 degrees 28. That's 192.03 feet. Delta Y, that horizontal distance, times the cosine of your azimuth. So that's 210.77 feet. So, lastly, we know the coordinates of A and A. We know the delta X and Y, so we can add those to our start point. So, our northing of station E is going to be equal to our start. 5,000 plus our delta Y, 210.77, so we get 5210.77 feet. Our easting station E is our start easting 10,000 plus our delta X. 192.03, 10,000, 192.03. Yeah. It depends on the calculator. So some calculator Some calculators don't, so you need to know what the calculator is called and do the, do the conversion if you've got something you want. That was in the uh, problem statement that, oh, that, yeah. that we did that field measurement, and that's what it came out to be. Yep. So that's the basic procedure where we've got our start point, known coordinates from that. We figure out you know, what our north is, what our azimuth is, back azimuth, field angle, and we convert our measured distances into delta x, delta y's, which in this case is coordinates. And then we've got another field angle, we can figure out that azimuth, we can figure out delta x, delta y. Continue to repeat that process around our polygon to get the station coordinates all the way around. Yeah. Um, so you're mentioning like station magnitudes. Like, is there just some kind of arbitrary random way to calculate station? Like, how, how does the machine work? Like, 
Yes, there is. Um, it's not necessarily at a convenient location. Um, the uh, next week, I'll look at state plane coordinates. And we'll look at the Oregon state plane. Oregon is divided into Oregon North and Oregon South. Um, you know, the reason we've got multiple state plane systems, and a lot of states are you know, divided into two or multiple state plane grids, is just because this is plane surveying where we're treating the Earth as a flat surface. In reality, it's not. And so if we look at a relatively small geographic region, the error we get with that is small. Once we start to cover longer and longer distances, the error we get to treating it as planar is more substantial. And so it just necessitates that, you know, once you get to a certain distance, you need to kind of correct for it and look at another flat plane and another flat plane. So just kind of keep sort of slicing regions of the sort of Earth's surface and saying like, here's our flat plane basis, Here's our flat plane basis. Here's our flat plane basis. Um, but yeah, the state plane coordinates often are uh, the east-west. I feel like is. I think I think it might actually be um, like out near the Pacific or something. You know, so like you know, your zero point there is kind of like you know way over there. Um, yeah. The north uh, northing. Field lab, we've often been sort of choosing an arbitrary elevation of 100 here. You know, often we might choose an arbitrary field coordinate here. Let's just say this current coordinate is 200, 100. Because when we're doing the field computation for a field notebook and things of that nature, it's just easier and you're less likely to make a mistake if you've got a smaller number, which is seven digit numbers. Um, so it's common that we'll have, you know, simpler coordinate systems for the field and you know and then our more complicated global system in the office. Okay. Other questions? So there's there's one other uh, feature in here. Uh, based on time I might skip this uh, for today. Two stages of known coordinates, and you generate those coordinates, and you send them out in your path. And that's what the layer that the sheet is actually sitting at. So we'll look on maybe on Wednesday at the start of class the math that that's doing to do that calculation. The last topic here is just kind of the types of error we have with our total stations because they're super accurate. And, you know, this is good. This is centering, lighting. So there can be a slight error we have with levelness. Z, the digital level that pops up, you, know, you want to get that as close to the middle as possible just because we have an off automatic compensator of three minutes so that as long as you stay from perfectly level to plus or minus three minutes of perfectly level, It'll do the onboard correction and it'll say, like, you can actually take two minutes out of level and it'll correct the numbers. So it'll just do that on you so it doesn't interrupt your work at all. And sometimes when you're just working on ground and I stand on this side versus I stand on this side, you know, there could be a little settling of the ground and just slightly trying to do that. And if you're as close to center as possible, that plus or minus three minutes. Uh, it's sufficient and it's not that we say like, oh, you're at a level because you're standing on the left side. Um, but if you're not 
really close to level in the mid, in the start. And let's say you're just on that borderline of that three minute compensation range, then that's where that thing is gonna slice heroin and then kill you. Oh, so that three minute minute compensation. So just be aware of that. Um, and you know these kind of alert you to that where they won't take measurements if you're out of that three minute range. They're like, at a level you gotta fix this. So, it could be a slight level there, but pretty minimal. It does onboard corrections. Temperature and pressure I talked about. A um, you know, little bit of settling there that could sort of be really small uh, air. You're not directly set up over the point, so you're doing the centering process, but maybe you're kind of cutting corners a little bit. Uh, so you're not being as precise with that. As you could be, so then that can sort of throw off some of your angle measurements. You know, if you're sort of further back versus further in versus off to the left, you can throw those angle measurements off a little bit that can introduce slight error. You know, when you're doing your sightings and uh, sort of focusing, you want to be as, as accurate as possible, um, and so you could have slight here with that if it's not aligned. But most all of these that we're talking about, each one of these components, you know, you're often in the, the minutes level of angular error that is just pretty small, small quantity. And so if you're using this instrument correctly and have some experience with it, um, the error that we get is quite small and they're just super accurate. Why they've been the workhorse of industry for the last, you know, thirty years, and even with more advanced technology with GPS and different things, like often it's just quicker and easier still to use a total station than some of these other uh, technologies that we have. So these aren't going away anytime soon. So if we want uh, to quantify error in our angular measurement. Our total stations, typically they've got a spec sheet that comes with them. So you look up your spec sheet for your total station um, and it'll come over here. You can look and see, depending on what mode you're working in, what the Last week we were talking about um, some of our distance elements, and there was like a distance component that was like PPM times of distance. So for this total station, if we're doing prism, which some of these prisms are reflective on top, um, our constant error or instrument error is plus or minus two millimeters, and then the distance component is two PPM times B. So we've got distance A, and so that would be what would be U for this. Two millimeters per million million millimeters times the distance. So uh, here you would put two times ten to the negative six times the distance would be the error component. And when we were doing that error check last week, it was the square root of the sum of the squares. So we have like a miscentering on the instrument, a miscentering on the reflector, instrument constant error, instrument distance error. So the distance error is a two millimeters times ten to the negative six times whatever that distance is. So that's 
that's all kind of distance related kind of errors for the angles themselves. reading there. So that would be the, the DIN accuracy for this instrument and the equation that is given here for what's the angular error is you look at whatever that error is based on your instrument, two times that divided by the square root of the number of High precision work, so this might be where you do more angles because you want to make this a bigger number on your denominator to make the error component smaller. So you do more scores to make this number bigger to make that score a little smaller versus your lower normal work. And you know, you always need sort of two measurements to have any statistic statistically significant sample. Um, but often that's sufficient for most of doing work because your start built in errors are so small. Any questions? Cool. Have a good Monday. See some of you tomorrow.